Thank you very much, uh, Marios, uh, for this uh, very nice introduction. And uh, thanks for inviting me to this uh, challenging workshop. Well, having worked for uh, several years uh, with neural networks, support vector machines, and uh, kernel methods, I was wondering, can we extract from this some, some general uh, unified picture, uh, which is at the same time also challenging uh, for the years to come? And so this will be the main part uh, for this uh, talk. The first part will be more on uh, methodological aspects. Uh, I will outline one unifying picture. There might exist other pictures, but this picture worked for many of the things that we are doing uh, today and probably also for uh, new things to come. Due to the limited time frame, uh, I will have to restrict the applications and uh, examples section a bit to uh, uh, examples from the area of unsupervised learning. So there are, will be uh, many more uh, examples and applications, but I will just briefly show some of uh, the successful applications in this direction. And then I will conclude with some uh, challenges in general for uh, computational intelligence. Uh, so what we see in a lot of different application areas is that they become more and more critically depending on high quality uh, predictive models. Uh, so often these data are in very high dimensional input spaces, uh, for example, in bioinformatics or, or in applications of brain tumor recognition. In other applications, well, the complexity is more in the other direction where you have given a lot of data points and uh, you would like to have a high quality predictive models for that or in complex networks or towards uh, brain machine intelligence. Uh, so classically, the dream in, in neural networks in the early days, I still remember when I was a PhD student, what I particularly liked uh, at that time about neural networks is that, well, you had a universal approximator everywhere where you saw a function f. Uh, you could think of it as being parameterized by a multilayer perceptron, and then you just optimize for the interconnection weights. And it works for controlling uh, systems uh, to make predictions, to do modeling, decision making. So this was a very interesting, challenging new paradigm. Uh, it was applicable to general uh, nonlinear problems. Uh, so both static and dynamic problems, recurrent networks, supervised and unsupervised. But there are two persistent problems, uh, let's say. Uh, the first one is, well, how do you cho choose the number of hidden units, for example, and how do you avoid problems uh, of uh, several local minima? So then the insights came with uh, support vector machines, uh, starting with the uh, work of Cortez and Vapnik, uh, where they have shown, like for classification and regression problems, how to reformulate uh, the model and uh, come up with convex optimization formulations. So, so in the last years, we have seen a lot of impact of convex optimization uh, schemes, not only for support vector machines, but also in general, also towards sparsity, for example, L1 regularization. Uh, and these techniques, well, they're also capable of working in uh, very high dimensional input spaces. So what is also nice here is that you can work with several types of kernel functions. You can also tune them towards your specific application and your specific data types. And so to just give some examples, you can also extract, for example, kernels from graphical models, from Bayesian networks, or develop specific kernels in bioinformatics, text mining, or spike kernels, for example. And you can develop special kernels uh, for such type of data and then just plug it in in your favorite support vector machine. Uh, and more general, well, kernel methods, they also have a, a long tradition in mathematics for about a century. Uh, so kernels are, of course, not new. They are not invented in the machine learning community, but uh, they exist for uh, many years. And what we see now today is that 
three main directions uh, have emerged. Uh, on the one hand, you can work with kernel methods in a primal dual setting, like in support vector machines. There has been a lot of work in connection to functional analysis, for example, learning and reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, and also in probabilistic modeling. Uh, that is more related to the paradigm of uh, Gaussian processes. Uh, so the things that I will be talking here today are mainly related to the first one, a primal dual setting. Uh, here you see a picture uh, from our book, uh, which I think is from a conceptual point of view quite challenging and uh, also unifying. Uh, so it's known uh, in a kernel metal support vector machines that uh, you can represent these models both in terms of feature maps and in kernels. Uh, so in fact, with one model, you can have two different representations. In the, in the primal, uh, you have then the, the feature map and the unknown W in the dual, which you see on bottom, you have the kernel function and then the alphas, well, they are then related to the support factors uh, in your kernel expansion. So if you make a linear discrimination in the high dimensional feature space, in the input space, it's implicitly corresponding to a nonlinear classification. Uh, the kernel trick serves as the bridge between the primal and the dual world. And you may wonder what is the connection between support vector machines and neural networks. Well, maybe support vector machines are, are even more neural networks than, than the original neural networks because, in fact, you have neural network interpretations both in the primal and in the dual representation. Uh, say you work with the Gaussian kernel, then in the dual, the number of hidden units that you have equals the number of support vectors, while in the primal, uh, you can also take a network interpretation where the number of hidden units uh, is then equal to the dimension of your feature map. So for a Gaussian kernel, you will have an infinite amount of hidden units in that uh, interpretation. Now, on the other hand, it's also interesting, this picture, because in the primal, in fact, the problem is parametric and, and the dual, it's more closely related to non-parametric problems. Uh, you, when you see, for example, in statistics, parametric and non-parametric statistics, they are quite different areas. And so here, you, in fact, you have a unifying picture uh, to integrate insights uh, from all of this uh, within one and the same methodology. Sometimes you have the choice between solving in the primal or the dual, and then you can also start tuning your representations with respect to uh, specific uh, models. And here you see how to proceed uh, within this picture. Uh, so this is, let's say, the classical picture, like you had with multilayer perceptrons. Uh, w would be your interconnection weights, and you just fit your model uh, to the given data. Now, usually you like to make everything as simple as possible, but in this case, it can be interesting to make the problem more complicated. So, in fact, of writing this as an unconstrained problem, you treat it as a constraint optimization problem. So you introduce the error variables as additional unknowns, and then you take as many constraints as there are number of training data points. And so the two problems are equivalent. The second one is more complicated, so you could wonder, why should we do this? Well, the nice thing is if you write down the conditions for optimality and you look at the dual, and the problem in the Lagrange multipliers, you get new representations for the model. And this can be quite interesting uh, for example, to work in high dimensional input spaces. Uh, let's take, for example, a simple linear model uh, where W and B are unknown. This is the primal representation. If you do that in the dual, you represent your model in terms of those alphas, uh, which are then the support values. But you see, yeah, in 
when you have, for example, an application like this, where you have a million data points, for example, in a 20 dimensional space, it's not very smart in this case to uh, solve the problem in the dual because your kernel matrix would be 1 million by 1 million. Uh, so while you have the choice here to also solve it in the primal, where you have only 20 unknowns in this case. So for this type of problems, it's better to go for the primal. Uh, while, for example, when you have high dimensional data and, and a few data points, well, then it's more convenient to solve the problem in the dual. Uh, so here you see you can really start playing around with different representations of models and depending on the nature of your application you can choose a specific representation. Uh, so if you keep this picture in mind and suddenly all of the things that you read about support vector machines and kernel methods become uh, much more clear. Well also within this spirit we have been uh, interested in extending uh, the work, original work of support vector machines to what we call least square support vector machines. Uh, it turns out that this is in fact more general. Uh, you would think, yeah, least square support vector machines, that's more specific, that's one loss function. Why would you do that? Well, in terms of least squares and equality constraints, it's in fact much easier to extend those ideas to a, a very wide range of problems in supervised and unsupervised learning. And so this is a bit like in the classical original spirit in, in neural networks where we were interested in applying the multilayer perceptrons to a very wide range of problems. Well, this is actually also possible for least square support vector machines. So here you see some of those primal formulations. Uh, the list is much longer, but uh, uh, here you see some examples for uh, supervised and unsupervised learning. Uh, so with equality constraints, you can keep your basic model sufficiently simple. Uh, if you have inequality constraints, already your basic core model becomes quite complicated. So if you want to do smarter things on top of it, uh, for example, include additional prior knowledge, you really start having lots of inequality constraints and uh, it, overall it becomes quite messy. Uh, so the claim is if you really want to understand the essence of things, it's, it's often good to, to look at the uh, LSSVM case first. And you can further build on that. Uh, you can work with the uh, core model, playing around with loss functions and, uh, and different regularization mechanisms. Doing that within such a constraint optimization framework enables to obtain the optimal representations of your models. Uh, classically, like with multilayer perceptrons, you start with a parameterized model and you just fit it to your data. Here, you additionally want to show what are the optimal representations of the models. Uh, we don't say that beforehand. We derive all of this from the conditions for optimality. So we not only derive the training problem, but also the optimal kernel representations. So within this picture, you can also integrate the picture from uh, parametric and non-parametric uh, problems uh, by considering different core models in connection to regularization schemes and uh, different constraints. So this brings me to uh, some examples. I will uh, first show some examples in uh, kernel spectral clustering. Uh, so spectral clustering has been uh, introduced earlier in the literature. So what we do here is view such eigenvalue problems for clustering. We view it as the training problem, in fact, as the dual problem to an underlying model specification. Uh, you see in the primal, you have a feature map and from that primal problem, you can derive this eigenvalue problem as the optimal solution. So instead of starting from the eigenvalue problem, you derive it as the optimal result. Uh, so you know under which uh, condition uh, this is optimal. And in fact, the advantage of doing so is that 
thanks to the fact that you have this characterization, you can also make out of sample extensions, for example, uh, develop new model selection criteria. You can uh, come up with new methods uh, for a large scale problems and things uh, like that, all thanks to these uh, complete uh, formulations for your problem. Uh, so here you have a simple toy problem with uh, three clusters. This is what you would traditionally also obtain with the k-means algorithm, for example. But say you have a new data point, what do you do then? Uh, so often you need to recluster, for example. But like in classification and regression problems, well, you learn a model from your given data, and then you use it later on for making predictions. And so we extend this idea here also to clustering. And so here you see the out of sample extensions uh, in regions of the underlying models. And so you can also start doing uh, things like cross validation, for example. And so you can also tune these models to get optimal results in the terms of generalization. And generalization and intelligence, well, those things are closely connected to each other. Here you see an example for a problem on image uh, segmentation. So the image on top is given. On bottom you get the segmentation result. And the picture at the right, that is a model selection curve. So you see there straight lines. And this is a good indication. This, in order to have a good model in this case, a good clustering, you should have straight lines in this uh, model selection curve. And you can evaluate this on validation data. So what you see here is really uh, an optimal clustering in the sense of optimal generalization with uh, validation uh, and cross-validation possibility. So here this is based on line structures, but you can also do this based on Fisher criteria on which you cross-validate and uh, so this can also give you nice results. Now this framework also enables you to sparsify uh, the models. Uh, so in, in uh, this picture, if you would work with the dense representation of your model, you would have more than 100,000 support factors uh, because you have more than 100,000 pixels. So what you see here is based on incomplete Foleski factorization the set of white points which serve then in fact as support factors in this model. So you see that this is already much sparser, but we can even go to very sparse representations in this case. Here you see another picture uh, together with the support factors, but we can really come to extremely sparse representations of the models. In order to have this uh, good segmentation result, you only need 12 support factors instead of uh, 100,000 if you work with a dense representation. So in this model selection curve that you see at the right, it turns out that the tips of those lines, well, they serve as prototype factors in this case. The points in the middle, well, they are at the boundaries between clusters, and then it's also enough in the middle of the line just to take uh, a few additional support factors. So for this type of applications, we can really come to uh, highly sparse representations. And so sparsity in general, yeah, also in statistics, uh, mathematics, ma machine learning, is quite an uh, important topic these days, uh, like with uh, L0 regularization or one regularization. So here you see alternative schemes to get uh, such highly sparse representations. Well, in fact, the kernel models, the kernel representations through such a constraint optimization problem, they also enable to put here additional constraints. Uh, if you have prior knowledge available, you can just try to add additional constraints. And from that, you can even derive new kernel functions, which are incorporating this prior knowledge. Uh, so here you see an example of that. The image at the left is given. Uh, you have here mainly three clusters, the sky, the ground, and the horses. 
And what you see here is the kernel spectral clustering without any prior knowledge. Uh, you see there, for example, the shadow of the horse, for which you have some ambiguity. Is this shadow belonging to the, to the horse or to the ground? If you do not tell this to the model, then of course the, the, the model cannot know it. Uh, so what we do here is add additional constraints, uh, which are indicated at the left. Uh, the things which are indicated in red, well, they tell that those two pixels should be within different clusters. And the ones in green, well, they indicate that th those two pixels should be within the same cluster. So you just give this little additional prior information to this model and uh, you get this uh, improved results. Uh, and you get the new kernel functions, you get them from free uh, through your conditions for optimality. So recently, uh, this month, we also published uh, a paper in neural networks on a hierarchical version of the kernel spectral clustering. Uh, so hierarchical schemes have been, for example, popular also in bioinformatics applications. Uh, here you see a microarray data set. And what we do is we look, in fact, at different scales for which the generalization of those models are stable. Uh, and related to that, we, we plot such a dendrogram. So that dendrogram that you see here is, in fact, optimal in the sense of generalization. Uh, so this is uh, quite promising to be applied also in uh, other areas. Here you see an example in a totally different area of uh, the Belgium power grid. Uh, so we have here time series available for uh, about 250 substations in, in the Belgian grid. And uh, this time series relates to uh, five years of data uh, for which we have the uh, electricity consumption. Uh, what people do classically in this area is first do dimensionality reduction and then apply, for example, some k-means clustering. So what we were doing here is directly clustering in the very high dimensional uh, input space. Uh, it's more than 40,000 dimensional uh, without any additional uh, pre-processing or something. Uh, you see that this kernel spectral clustering is uh, quite powerful. Here you see three different profiles of different uh, customers, uh, residential, industrial uh, profile, depending on uh, this consumption. So this type of method gave nice improvements over the traditional methods. So here I also would like to uh, explain about uh, a new method for uh, data visualization. A few years ago, it was published in the IEEE transactions on uh, neural networks. Uh, so traditionally, well, you're all used to work with uh, self-organizing maps. And in recent years, there uh, has also been quite some interest in uh, manifold learning techniques uh, like uh, Laplacian eigen maps and locally linear embedding, for example. So in this new method, uh, which is called kernel maps with a reference point, the problem is characterized by solving a linear system. Uh, just like we do LSSVM for classification and regression, where you only have to solve a linear system as a training problem, and then do a bit of cross-validation to determine your tuning parameters, well, you can also do it for this type of problems. And so you can solve it as a linear system and doing cross-validation, having out-of-sample extensions and all of that. So how does that work? And so you start thinking in terms of a simple core model. In this case, this is LSSVM. Your given data x are in the input space, and you want to map them to new coordinates z uh, for, for visualization. And these new coordinates, they are unknown. In this case, you have two sets of uh, constraints. And because in this example, you want to map to a two-dimensional space. If you want to map to a three-dimensional space, you have there three constraints. 
And so they all map to different coordinates. You see uh, in the objective function regularization terms and uh, also the errors that you minimize. So this is the starting point. You define a core model. But then, yeah, you do not just want to map these data. You also want that data points which are close in the original input space are also close to each other in the target space. Uh, so you want to have some topology preserving map. And this is done by adding this additional regularization term. Uh, so it's a modified form of locally linear embedding. If you solve this problem, well, as the dual, you will get an eigenvalue uh, decomposition problem. But we can, in fact, convert eigenvalue problems into linear systems just by considering an additional reference point. And so we had two additional constraints there where we approximately fix the coordinates for one single point. And so if you write out the conditions for optimality for this problem and you look what the dual is, it's just a linear system. It takes two pages to derive it, but the final result is really easy, just solving a linear system. And you can start doing cross-validation on that use out of sample extensions. So here is a simple toy problem of that. So the data which are given are shown at the left. Uh, it's this three-dimensional spiral. And we divide that into a training, a validation, and a test set. Uh, so the blue parts is the training part. This is the only data used for solving that linear system. And the other parts are validation and testing. So the result that you see here at the right also show the re results for the out of sample extension. So for example, the red part is the generalization of the underlying model to the, to the new data. And the two views that you see here is the result for two different choices of the reference point. So you see that this reference point, it's like choosing a perspective on the object. It's like an eye to look at the object, uh, and you can create uh, different representations in this way. So here you see another example on uh, real life data sets, uh, uh, visualizing a gene distribution where you not only have training genes then, but you also have validation and test genes. And this is then uh, the result for getting an optimal data visualization uh, with out of sample extensions. Well, at the beginning, I've also talked a bit about uh, different possible kernel functions that you can plug in in uh, support vector machines, and also in least square support vector machines. So in all of the things that I've shown here, you can just plug in whatever positive definite kernel that you like. Uh, but in fact, we are still quite far away from a general theory uh, on what are the right kernel functions. If you have given data, could you tell us, is there a general theory which could tell what is the the optimal kernel functions. Uh, here and there, you have some results that are like related to differential geometry or information theory uh, and things like that, but still not, not yet a unifying theory. So here I would like to show some recent results that we have on the interface between tensors and kernels. Uh, so in a lot of applications, your data also are naturally represented by data tensors. Uh, for example, uh, in an in a image uh, application, well, your, your input data are matrices, in fact. Or when you have video sequences, you have then uh, a tensor of, of data. And because you also have the time axis. Uh, a simple way to proceed is that you just vectorize the data. Uh, so from this matrix or this tensor, well, if you just uh, scan it column-wise, for example, you vectorize the results and you plug it in in an RBF kernel, you can immediately apply a support vector machine to it. But you may, of course, lose a lot of structure of your data. 
And so what we have shown in recent uh, publications is by means of tensorial kernels, which are also related to the use of higher order statistics. You can also use it on time series. Uh, you can, in fact, get better results and learn from fewer amounts of uh, training data. Uh, if you compare it with the universal kernel, like the Gaussian kernel, you can uh, do it in both ways, but with such a tensorial kernel, you need fewer amounts of training examples. And this is, after all, also one of the key challenges in intelligence. Uh, how can we learn from few examples? And so exploiting structure in, in your data is therefore also quite important. And so here you see uh, another uh, example, which is in uh, the area of uh, mass spectral imaging, where you also have tensor data available. And here we use also more sophisticated regularization schemes uh, related to nuclear norm regularization, trace norm, regularization, and here you see an example on tensor completion. Uh, for example, in compressed sensing sparsity, there is a lot of interest in uh, matrix completion problems. So we have recently also extended this to uh, tensor completion problems. So it's time to uh, sum up and uh, conclude uh, the talk. Uh, so from what I have explained, I think we might derive three main challenges. There are, of course, many more specific challenges. But one important challenge is certainly uh, when you start doing more advanced things, how can you still have sufficient contact, contact with the end user? Uh, because you tend to make your models more complicated, but the end users should still understand what, what is going on. So also the interpretability of the models uh, is also very important, or incorporating, for example, prior knowledge into your schemes. So that's something that I see as a, as a main challenge for the coming years. Another important challenge is maybe also the need for new mathematical frameworks. Uh, I, I put here some uh, emphasis on a primal dual setting, uh, but you can also do optimization like in Hilbert spaces, Banach spaces. Um, so my feeling is that maybe in the next 10 to 20 years, maybe whole new mathematical frameworks uh, will have to emerge. And you see, for example, a lot of activity and results these days related to compressed sensing sparsity, but all of this is related to parametric models. On the other hand, you have a lot of interesting results in kernels and support vector machines, but this is all non-parametric. Uh, so I see it as a big challenge in the coming years to try to get a unifying framework uh, in which you can integrate several of these techniques. Uh, so I've shown you that this primal dual setting might be one of the possible frameworks, but my feeling is that, well, new mathematical frameworks may emerge and might eventually be better uh, for the coming years. And another important thing is scalability. Uh, from the moment that you start doing more complicated things at more constraints, then also your dual problems start to get more complicated. Uh, like a couple of years ago, uh, you could only tackle a few hundred data points, let's say, for more sophisticated methods. Uh, so for a lot of applications, this is, of course, not satisfactory. So we really need to scale up and come up with uh, entirely new models. Uh, for the standard support vector machine, there has been a lot of research, like in decomposition methods or SMO, uh, but it's always for one specific model. Uh, so that's not really what we need, I think. Uh, what we need in the coming years is more generically applicable methodologies uh, that are universally applicable to a wide range uh, of problems. So finally, I also want to thank a lot of co-workers uh, for the joint work and uh, also several funding agencies. 
And uh, this finally concludes my talk. Thank you. Excellent presentation, Jochen. Uh, really appreciated all the applications and also the, the intuition in, the, in that you provided. It's always inspiring to, to know that you think you know a problem and you hear it from a different angle. It's always uh, very refreshing. Um, do we have any questions? About uh, your question is about interpretability. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. What I mean, for example, if you use a, a sparsity scheme, uh, for example, in connection to feature selection, um, that you have interpretable models. Uh, or we, for example, have recently published a, a paper in PLOS One where we work with. Uh, uh, a new type of uh, regularization uh, scheme and special type of basis functions for uh, application in a clinical decision support systems uh, because of course in uh, these type of applications the interaction with the doctors and and the patients is very important and you should also be able to explain your model so we can by using specific regularization schemes, we can, in fact, uh, obtain, well, an interpretable model which, which is also optimal in the sense of generalization, let's say, and which is really nice for, for interpretation purposes. Uh, but also traditionally in the computational intelligence, also in, in fuzzy systems, fuzzy models, there has been a lot of emphasis on, on the interpretations uh, of models and, and the interaction with the end users. So, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Jochen.